and welcome back to Saturday, and here's your Muggles History of Magic. First this week, uh, Carol brought up the question of whether or not Lucius knew what he was doing, if, if it was all kind of planned from him. And I kind of don't think it is, I don't know this for sure. But I think he was grasping at straws. I think he was just trying to cause trouble. And, and I don't think he knew exactly what was going to happen. I think he just hoped that something would happen. I think that he was trying to be malicious, but he didn't really have control over the situation. Amanda actually thinks that he was just trying to get rid of incriminating evidence. And I think that's also a very large possibility. Um, so getting to the book, holy crap, the bad guy was the guy from the diary by way of Ginny Weasley, Ron's annoying little sister. Um, once again, I did not see it coming. I was completely blown away, so yay for J.K. Rowling. Poor Ginny, though, I, as annoying as I find her a lot of the time, you gotta cut her some slack. She's 11 years old, and she just went through kind of a lot. This was a big thing for her to deal with, so I feel bad for being so mean about Ginny all the time. Um, one thing I want to bring up that's kind of complaining about the movie, it's just one little thing that I have a problem with, um, Phoenix Song. In the book, it's described as uh, eerie, spine-tingling, unearthly music. It's supposed to be beautiful and comforting. And in the movie, it's terrifying. And the bird flies in. And pardon my bird impression that I'm going to do right now. But it's like, ah! which is really, really scary. I probably just scared you. I scared me a little bit there. Um, so I don't like that. I love Fox in the books. And I don't love movie Fox because I'm terrified of him. Uh, my favorite line in this section is one that others have mentioned, and it's the, uh, it is our choices, Harry, that show what we truly are far more than our abilities. And it's for the same reasons that everyone else listed, but I definitely had to put that in there, that I love that line, and I've used it in things before. Um, it's just a very powerful line, and I feel it's very true. Okay, so getting to the historical aspect. First, we're going to start with the basilisk. This is absolutely the stuff of legends. Um, reports kind of range from what they look like being huge, kind of like we've seen, to small, about 12 inches long. Um, um, they are called the King of Serpents, but more because they're supposed to have crown-like markings on their head. Uh, some reports show them as, as purely serpent, and some of them they have chicken parts, uh, chicken feet or chicken wings, things like that. Uh, the rooster crowing aspect and the deadly stare are straight out of legend. Those are common elements. Um, common practice or common idea on how to kill a basilisk was uh, to show it its own reflection, so carry on a mirror, and that's exactly what Hermione was attempting to do. Um, one thing that is part of legend that we don't see in the books is apparently the scent of a weasel is supposed to kill a basilisk as well. You lock it in the, the den of a weasel and the smell will kill it eventually, so I wonder if alternative to stabbing it with the sword of Gryffindor if Harry had lured it to the burrow and shut it in, it might have also killed the basilisk. Um, in today's world, the basilisk is a real animal. It's a member of the iguana family. It uh, lives in Central and South America, I believe. It is one of the lizards that runs really, really fast and can look like it's walking on water, and it looks like this. So next we have phoenixes, which are also definitely the stuff of legend. They, um, there's a couple different versions of them, some Greco-Roman, some Arabian, some Egyptian, Chinese. Uh, the physical description that we get of, of the phoenix is most like that of the Greek and Roman tales, the crimson and gold, um, looks kind of like an eagle. Um, but the behavior that we get from Fox, the, uh, the attacking of the snake, um, is more Chinese. Um, so our phoenix is kind of a blend of the different, different versions. The, um, the rebirth from ashes is obviously a, a very common element among phoenix tales. And now we're coming to the spoiler section. Nathaniel brought back his spoiler section this week, and I'm doing the same thing. I'm going to be talking major spoilers. If you have not read the end of this series, you need to go away now. Thank you for watching, and I will see you next week. Uh, for those of you who are sticking around. Okay, I've got a couple different things. First, this week, uh, Amanda and I had a discussion about Horcrux attraction and how it differs different people, different Horcruxes. Um, for example, with the diary, Harry and Hermione are both very interested in the diary, and Ron isn't having any of it. He doesn't like it, he doesn't care. 
Um, whereas it's the opposite with the locket when it comes to Ron. Ron is very, very affected by the locket, much more so than, than either Harry or Hermione. I think that's interesting. That also brought up for me Ginny. Um, Ginny is very, very affected by the diary. And I wonder if her attraction to the diary and her attraction to Harry are somehow linked. If she's sensing something in both of them that that she is attracted to or that is catching her attention. This is not to say that I think that Ginny is attracted to Lord Voldemort in any way. I just wonder if she's recognizing that there's something in the diary that is a common element to something in Harry, who she already loves. Or fangirls over. Next, after watching kind of what Ginny's gone through in this book, it makes me think that, romantically speaking, Harry could not have ended up with anyone who was not in his immediate group. Um, you know, I think about Cho and he, how he could never actually have ended up with Cho because she would never understand everything that he's been through. She would never understand the journey that they've all taken. It would have to be one of the three female members of his group. It would have to be Ginny who went through this or Hermione who's been tortured and went with him on the, on the quest to find the Horcruxes or Luna who was, you know, imprisoned in Malfoy Manor for months. It would have to be someone who could share those experiences with him. Okay, and lastly, I'm going to disagree with Jesse pretty vehemently on Voldemort. Um, you may find him annoying, that's fine, I, I can find him annoying. But you say that you would not be remotely intimidated by him or impressed by him. But that's the thing, of course you wouldn't be intimidated by him because he wouldn't want you to be. He's very manipulative and he's very charming. He would want you to be charmed by him. If he wanted to, in to intimidate you, he could. Because, yeah, you say he didn't actually kill Morning Myrtle, but guess what? He's still responsible for her death. If at 16 I hired a hitman to kill someone, yeah, I'm still pretty intimidating. I'm still a 16-year-old responsible for someone's death. And don't forget that at 16 he also killed his father and his grandparents. So he's still already committing murders, even if he didn't actively kill Myrtle with his own two hands. Um, I still think that he should get a lot of credit. He's still a very evil person at this point and he's still very powerful, and he's still very manipulative. So I'm a little more impressed by him than you are. Okay, and that's all I have for this week. I will see you next week, and we're starting Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. And like Amanda mentioned, this is the book in which you will encounter our ongoing fight. We will probably have a special video to go over the fight. It will be posted on Sunday, but that won't be next week. That'll be a couple weeks into it. Um, so Prisoner of Azkaban, yay, and goodbye.